audience here. Um, and I should note to begin with that um, we're recording this and intending to put it out. And I hope that will be okay with everyone. So it will be out in the public realm, um, just so everyone's aware of that. Um, uh, if I can perhaps just ask people, if you're, you're not speaking, if you're in the audience, if you're able to mute yourself, it does sometimes help. Barking dogs, ringing doorbells and various other things sometimes do create some confusion. It would, it would be helpful. Um, but I think that's, Chris, I think that's all of the administrative things that I need to cover. Um, okay, so I want to begin by welcoming Sophie Richardson to join us at this event for the All-Party Parliamentary Group in Hong Kong. Um, you will have noticed from the title that we're looking at repression in Hong Kong, Zhang, Xinjiang and Tibet. Um, I think where I personally come from in this is I decided to focus on Hong Kong because from the UK perspective with the joint declaration, I've always, you know, there's so many things one can do in a foreign affairs and there's only so many hours of the day. I've always tried to focus on things that the UK um, can particularly influence, has a particular direct route into and through the joint declaration, obviously, with regard to Hong Kong, that case. But I think we are also getting to the point where we really need to join up of these issues. You know, they're happening kind of in, in three corners, three quarters of a triangle in China in different parts, but they're all part of the same story. And that's one of the things that always has been my um, issue with human rights. I think very often human rights has been used by people to uh, beat people with whom they have, they have um, uh, concerns about for other reasons or conflict with for other reasons. And they say those people, terrible people doing things about human rights whilst their friends, allies, uh, people who are perhaps enemies of their enemies um, have been given a free pass. And I think it's really important we join all of these things up together and say that human rights are universal and we should be fighting for them everywhere around the world, whether it's our friends, um, our enemies or anywhere in between on that spectrum. So um, what we wanna to do today is really get a picture of how this all joins up, how this fits together. And we really could uh, have a better speaker for this than Dr. Sophie Richardson, who's the China Director of Human Rights Watch. Um, I could say need no introduction, but that's well way overused as a phrase. Uh, the author of numerous articles on domestic Chinese political reform, democratization and human rights um, in Cambodia, China, Indonesia, Hong Kong, the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, she's testified to the European Parliament, the US Senate and House of Representatives and commented on every media outlet you can think of. So I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Sophie, to really set the scene, expecting you to speak for about half an hour, then we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A and discussion. Thanks very much, Sophie. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's, it's lovely to see old friends and, and meet new ones. Uh, I would like, among other things, to acknowledge that some of the people as in this discussion this morning are extremely knowledgeable, too, on these topics. And so I hope that we can, on some level, treat this uh, as much as a brainstorming, a collective brainstorming session, uh, rather than me spending time telling you things you already know. That's not a great use of your time. But perhaps to, to pick up where, where Natalie wrapped and, and try to have a consistent theme throughout this discussion, I think we're at a point in time where there is growing attention to the fact that for decades now, the Chinese government has faced no meaningful consequences for industrial scale human rights violations. That efforts to date to raise cases or demand accountability or cease practices or revise laws has not only failed to achieve much progress on those individual particular issues, but that because Beijing has not had to suffer any particular consequences for any of these actions, in fact, it has effectively come to believe that it will never be challenged over any of these things. I think that has started to change or the, the, the press for some broader effort towards accountability and investigations has changed a bit in the last year, partly as a function of international horror at what's happening in Xinjiang, partly at the brazenness of the violations of the Sino-British Joint Declaration partly at the global consequences 
uh, of the Chinese government suppressing information around the early stages of the pandemic. You know, I, I had not, if you had asked me a year ago to expect calls from state and local officials, not just in the US, but in other countries, to ask why the Chinese government wouldn't be honest about coronavirus in January and February, I would, have, I, I would not have expected to have to do that. And yet here we are. <laughs> I, I also want to be careful to say, or not careful, but, but, but to thank uh, the UK for its leadership in the last year or so on a number of these issues and at institutions like the Human Rights Council. Uh, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, I think it would have been <laughs> better if those efforts had come much earlier, but better late than never. And I think now there really is a much more broad coalition of states to be mobilized. So I would like very much to come back to talking about the steps that we would like to see the UK lead on, particularly as it joins the Human Rights Council uh, in at the beginning of 2021. We feel very strongly that the appropriate next steps are a special session and urgent debate, and particularly the appointment of a standing mandate holder to look at human rights violations inside China and by the government outside China to regularly report to the council to continue the press for an investigation into gross human rights violations in Xinjiang, even if Chinese authorities will not allow people into the country. You can run a perfectly good investigation from the outside, as we know from many other recent cases. Uh, you know, and that's, that's as much a political matter as anything else, but there's real momentum. And I think to fail to capitalize on that at the moment would be to fail the people inside China who are suffering and looking to these institutions for relief. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can, we can tie that all back up together, but maybe a brief word each on, on Xinjiang and Hong Kong and Tibet. Maybe I'll start with Hong Kong having spent some of my morning wading through the newly released five-year plan. These are not page turners. This is the Chinese government's uh, uh, way of setting out its priorities for the coming years. And there's some very alarming rhetoric in there about Hong Kong that among other things implies that the Chinese authorities will seek to, to assert greater if not full control over governance in Hong Kong by 2025. 2025, as you all know, is not 2047. <laughs> mm. So the, <laughs> they seem to be expediting the timetable a little bit. But just in the past few weeks, we have seen a second arrest under the new national security law, uh, a pretty radical shift to the operating environment, really for anybody who's not pro-Beijing. And by that, I mean for pro-democracy uh, LegCo members for independent civil society, for journalists. Uh, we found the raid on the Apple Daily uh, and an arrest earlier this week of a documentary filmmaker who had uh, detailed uh, some of the police abuses against protesters last summer uh, was arrested earlier this week. These are terrible signs. I don't need to tell you all what the arrest of journalists <laughs> means. Uh, you know, I think the, the near term goal for the next year for the central government and its, you know, and its its proxies in Hong Kong, I think that's the charitable word one could use at this moment, uh, is really to shape the electoral environment next year to produce with a facade of democratic process, you know, precisely the ledge code that Beijing wants, uh, and that will, I think, be a combination of preventing certain kinds of people from running blocking certain kinds of people who are current members who want to stand for re-election. Uh, I think we'll see an endless slew of spurious lawsuits to prevent people from standing. And all the while, we'll watch the media slowly be eroded, the civil service increasingly politicized, uh, the education system more closely resemble what happens in the mainland and really the space for independent civil society to shrink. Uh, so I, I think the next year or so is looking fairly grim. Uh, you know, one of the realities that, that we as an organization are grappling with is what's happened as Hong Kong can no longer be a safe haven 
for many activists. You know, a community that had been physically together in the same city and able to collaborate safely, securely, creatively, mm -hmm. now scattering. Some people are obviously choosing to stay, others are leaving, but that has, you know, that has consequences, not just for activism inside Hong Kong, but for a long time, Hong Kong really has been one of the key hubs of activism around the mainland. And that's much less the case now. <clears throat> and I think there are, you know, the, so there are consequences for everyone's ability to track developments inside the mainland or provide safe haven for people who are leaving. Um, you know, again, kudos to the UK for trying to find ways to expand access for people who want to shift from Hong Kong to the UK without having necessarily to claim asylum. I think that's a very constructive step. People don't necessarily want to have to buy a one-way ticket. And I think creating lots of different opportunities for them uh, is extremely helpful. But the longer term, uh, I think prospects are fairly grim. So shifting to something that's perhaps even grimmer. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, does the five-year plan say anything about the judiciary? Actually, I should ask as a process question, do we want to pause after each of these and talk a little bit about Hong Kong before moving on to Tibet or Xinjiang? Natalie, what's your preference? Um, how, how about if we operate, does that work quite well? If you've got a very specific question to something that, that um, Sophie's just said, if you can put it in the chat box and Sophie can pick it up in the discussion uh, and then but we'll have the main Q&A at the end, I think. So Sophie, you know, if something appears in the chat box and it fit, you can fit it in, right. otherwise we'll take it up at the end. Thanks. Thank you for this question. I haven't gotten to the section on judicial reform yet. It's the document hasn't been released yet in English, and I, I still re I read slowly in Chinese. Uh, so, and I was focused particularly on these parts in preparation for today's call. I'm happy to follow up on your question when I get to that section if I have a more informed answer. I should also say that you know the case of the twelve Hong Kong people who were trying to get to Taiwan who've now been taken to the mainland is. Mm -hmm. I mean, very worrying. You know, I mean, let's be clear, the protests last year started over concerns precisely about extradition to the mainland where people would face trial without fair trial rights, and here we are. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm happy to follow up on this question uh, about the judiciary. It's worrying to see judges uh, stepping down and quietly indicating that they're doing so because they felt they no longer had the kind of independence or, or felt that over time they would no longer have independence. Others obviously don't see the situation that way, but I think it's, it would be naive to think that at some point the sort of tectonic plates of you know, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which still pertains in Hong Kong, and mainland style law aren't going to collide in Hong Kong's judiciary. And there's going to be enormous pressure on those judges to decide precisely the way Beijing wants them to, not the way international human rights law suggests it should. And I think we would all be wise to keep an eye on those particular kinds of cases. They'll come sooner rather than later, I think. So hopefully that's, that's helpful for now. You're very welcome. Um, I think there is no reason to think that the situation in Xinjiang has improved. Uh, it may have changed a bit in the sense that it appears, it's very difficult to confirm, but it appears that some people are now being moved out of political education centers and into formal detention facilities. But it's very difficult to verify this because it's gotten even harder for people who have been uh, detained in either kind of facility to get out of the country and share information. Uh, I think it is fair to say also that the Chinese government has significantly stepped up its efforts to terrify diaspora members worldwide um, to discourage their sharing stories with groups like us or with the media. Um, you know, but, but what's clearly missing is any sort of good news. You know, if, if anyone who's on this call is aware of Uyghurs or Kazakhs or Kyrgyz in diaspora communities who are suddenly able to talk to their family members again, I'd love to hear about that. But we're not aware of any improvements in access to information or family members, greater contact, clarifications, of whereabouts, well-being, status. Uh, 
you know, at the same time, we see more evidence of deeply problematic policies around uh, you know, issues like uh, forced sterilizations, uh, forced labor. I think there has been some success in mobilizing international firms to be a little more aware of problems or potential problems in their supply chains, or at least get a number of them to acknowledge that they know they can't do adequate human rights due diligence. Uh, whether that prompts them to really change their operations as opposed to hire more PR officers, uh, you know, that's, that's a different matter. Um, uh, I think that's sort of the, that's, that's a quick wrap with respect to Xinjiang. I think some of the legislative initiatives, including in, in the UK parliament are, that look at issues like forced labor, I think are extremely helpful. Um, I think those companies do have a role to play in, at a minimum, you know, if, if, they're, if they're going to be on the right side, those companies should be pressuring local and, and central government authorities in China uh, for the kind of access that human rights due diligence merits, right? <laughs> and ultimately that's, that's in keeping with the press for access for, for example, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, I don't think that companies really want to do that. I don't think they're really trying to, we don't see a lot of evidence of that. But I think some of the, the legislative efforts uh, that are under consideration there and here in the U.S. Uh, there's helpful legislation around the idea of a rebuttable presumption for imports from Xinjiang is helpful in putting some, some positive pressure on companies. Uh, you know, I think the, the just quickly on um, connecting back to the discussion about impunity and the need for accountability, you know, the Chinese government has has and will continue to resist and will sink enormous resources as a Human Rights Council member into thwarting any forward movement on the idea of an investigation into serious human rights violations in Xinjiang. Nevertheless, we all know that terrific UN-driven investigations on Venezuela, North Korea, uh, the Rohingya have all been carried out outside those countries because all of those governments denied the high commissioner access. You know, so from our perspective, there's no reason OHCHR can't press ahead with gathering testimony outside the country, compiling a report that, in, that could include or draw on existing open sources. Uh, I think the, 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 the political imperative now is for the High Commissioner herself to commit to doing this and to make that commitment public, to put the Chinese government on notice that she is gathering information with a view towards reporting to the council. Uh, I think everybody knows that this sort of diplomatic dance <laughs> of her saying she wants to go, the Chinese government saying it wants her to come, mm -hmm. when we all know that <laughs> the Chinese government most certainly does not want her to come or give her an unfettered visit is just not going to happen. And I think we can move on past that and not really, I think there's no need to continue dignifying that debate. So we can come back to that. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at this note in the chat from Mr. Carmichael. Oh, please do. Please. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> it looks like I was, I was there if you want to unmute yourself. <laughs> Okay, I hope I've not just uh, raised expectations here uh, to, to, to disappoint. Um, I met with um, the, uh, the, the, the Vice President for their sort of corporate affairs um, um, wing and some of their, their other Canadian officers. It's about the third or fourth time that they've been in. Uh, it was virtually this time, obviously. Um, and previously, the engagement was fairly neutral because, frankly, they weren't really telling me anything that I couldn't verify independently. And it was polite. I was not, you know, I wasn't going to uh, sort of um, take their word for anything, but they weren't really offering an awful lot. Um, this time, however, they brought Pierre Prosper with them who is their sort of human rights auditor. And um, he's an interesting guy if you, you, you know, just even just put his name in Google. 
Um, and he was quite candid about the uh, fact that when high vision were doing this work in Xinjiang, that they weren't uh, carrying out the due diligence. They weren't asking the, uh, the questions about how the equipment was going to be used, about um, what the, the consequences of their work would be. Um, and he was openly critical in, in front of them to me. Um, and, um, you know, I guess he is there to find a way of, of constructing something that is going to limit their reputational damage um, uh, politically and internationally. Uh, I'm casting around my desk at the moment to see if I can find my note of the, the meeting. I will find them eventually and I'll circulate them. If I put them to you, Chris, maybe you could circulate them to the, 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 the other people who are here. Um, and uh, it, 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 so he was quite critical of them, and he's trying to find a way uh, of of repairing some of the damage. I'm not entirely sure uh, what that will look like. One of the questions I asked him was whether, given the fact that um, High Vision, you, you know, built this massive surveillance system in Xinjiang. Um, and have seen how to do facial recognition uh, technology and surveillance at scale, uh, do they then have a big commercial advantage from a fairly unpleasant source uh, going ahead? And again, he seemed to be fairly open about saying that, yes, they would have. Um, one of the things that he said that I would be interested to get your take on, Sophie, is um, he said that even he had not been allowed any access to Xinjiang to see the, the, the equipment in operation there, um, even though he is effectively working for Hike Vision now. Um, I'm, I'm seeing you nodding. Is that legit? I mean, do, do I believe that he has not been allowed to visit the region? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I've no doubt that he's not, but, you know, right. would it ever have been possible for him to get to, uh, it, to, get to, to visit Xinjiang? Because it strikes me, here's Hike Vision, who still have actually got ongoing care and maintenance obligations in respect of that uh, technology as it's operating in Xinjiang. Um, it was just, maybe it's my sort of suspicious mind here, but it was just too convenient that he'd asked for things that he'd not been allowed to see. Um, and was that a political act on the part of Hype Vision? Uh, the other people on the call will tell you I'm an as suspicious person, and these are just the thoughts that come to my mind. I, I, look, I think it's entirely possible that that he would have made a feint at asking to visit and not yeah. fought back very hard when denied. I think that's what many of these companies do. There's sort of a minimal box checking exercise, especially, uh, you know, especially if the company itself is not willing to impose some sort of consequence when they're knocked back that way. Yeah. It's very easy. For the authorities to just say forget it uh, we were part of a conversation with a very large company uh, a week or two ago which had recently and publicly said that it had sent auditors uh, to do due diligence and that they had found no problems in their manufacturing facility and when we got on the phone i said please tell me all about that how did you get permission? Who did they talk to? How did yeah. that go? At which point they actually they admitted that, in effect, the only people who had been allowed to visit that facility were representatives of the trade unions in the country where the company is headquartered, who had come to talk to the foreigners in the facility. Yeah. And they had sent quality control inspectors for the products that they make from another facility in a different part of the country. Not a single one of these people yeah. 
either relevant language. Not a single one of them was trained in human rights due diligence. Not a single one of them even tried to talk to a worker. Mm -hmm. Look, I don't want to hijack this conversation. I've now found my notes here. I can give you two or three minutes uh, of the sort of standard points from the discussion, or I can uh, break it up and circulate it, whichever, whichever. That would be, it would be very interesting to see that. Also, just for, for everyone on the call to know that Hike Vision technology was used, is used in what's called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, which is the police app we reverse engineered and wrote about last year that's used to track enormous amounts of behavior of people across the region, much of it illegal, but use that as a basis for determining what the authorities consider suspicious behavior and in some yeah. cases arbitrarily detain them. So Hike Vision has a lot of explaining to do. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm still trying to get over the idea yeah, well, that Pierre Prosper is working for them. Well, yeah, um, but uh, there you go, it's a fine old world. Uh, um, I, I'm just wondering if we can just move on, Alistair, and you can sure, circulate yeah. those, and just so because there's there's a lot of ground to cover, and it, sure. uh, I, if we go down, what I think there are a lot of burrows we can get very deep in, but I try and keep the overview as well. Sure. Shall I shift to Tibet? Excellent. Um, one of the I think one of the the consistent pathologies we see in Chinese government policy in all three of these regions really is an effort to. Uh, weaken, limit, and or erase the distinct identities of peoples. Uh, and one of the most common elements of that in all three regions really is language. You know, a few years ago, authorities in Hong Kong started to insist that classes be taught in Mandarin and not in Cantonese. We've seen that for a long time in Xinjiang. We published a report earlier this year about uh, sort of the facade of bilingual education in Tibet. And we had known for a long time that secondary and tertiary education was provided now almost Hi. entirely in Chinese rather than in Tibetan. Hi. But we've now been able to- No, I was, I, I'm in a meeting now, so that's all right. I was- Sorry, a little, yeah, it's all right, sorry. That's no, fine. But we've now been able to show that that even extends to very to the primary level to very young children. Uh, although it's worth pointing out that our colleagues who work on children's rights were as taken aback by the language policies as they were the idea that children as young as three and four are being taught Xi Jinping thought. <laughs> they were astonished at the politicization of education at that level. Uh, and we had pursued this topic partly because Tibetans inside and outside the region had asked us to focus on this because they feel it's such a clear assault on their distinct identity and that language is so fundamental to you know, the maintenance of culture, of religion, of tradition, and that to have it essentially leached out of the educational system was another way of uh, you know, succeeding Xi Jinping's campaign of so-called cynicization, the idea of creating sort of model loyal uh, party adherents who don't have markers or affinities to religions or cultural traditions or languages that the party thinks of as being uh, a threat to political loyalty. You know, we continue to write about appalling uh, restrictions on religion, both in Tibet and in Xinjiang, grossly intrusive policies that effectively criminalize any, any de demonstrations of faith outside uh, what the state deems appropriate. Uh, and in both, in both Xinjiang and Hong Kong, sorry, in Xinjiang and Tibet, we've looked at really the radical expansion of the security apparatus. It's much more high tech and hard edged in Xinjiang. Uh, it's a little more tech uh, in Tibet, but we've seen thousands of cadres sent out across the Tibetan plateau you know, to do very uh, kind of human to human uh, intelligence gathering and surveillance. Uh, you will have read of late perhaps some news reports uh, alleging that half a million Tibetans are now uh, in forced labor camps, we have different information. Um, 
the, the, the starting point of this is really that the Chinese government takes the position that Tibetans, and to, to a lesser extent in other regions, that people need to be moved into urban areas, into cash economies where they are legible to the authorities. And in Tibet, that's meant over the last decade, about 2 million people have been forcibly settled in more urban areas. Uh, they have been removed from existences as nomads, as pastoralists, as farmers. Uh, and a not insignificant number of them actually are struggling essentially to support themselves. We've documented this in, in earlier reports. The latest so-called poverty alleviation campaign involves a requirement that at least one person in each family be in some kind of cash labor. Uh, that's preferable to the authorities for a number of reasons, not least that it's easier to keep an eye on them. And it is in the context of that program that we're aware that of half a million Tibetans having been registered to go through certain kinds of job training programs, uh, you know, and that they don't really have the ability to opt out of that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you don't get to say, no, thanks, I don't want to do that, or I'd like to go back to living the way I want to. It's not our sense at this point that that kind of training is as abusive or heavy handed and that it, and it's not our sense as what's happened in Xinjiang, it's not our sense uh, that that involves mass arbitrary detention. But I think, you know, we will look back 10 or 20 years from now and see these programs as fundamentally having radically reshaped the political economies of the region, you know, and forced people to live and work only in the ways that the state allows them. And there are multiple different serious human rights violations along the way. So that's sort of a, a, a recent snapshot of Tibet. So I'll pause and maybe answer questions about that. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the kinds of next steps we would want to see a government like the UK's take. Okay, well, to give a bit of structure to this, perhaps if we can ask people to ask questions um, about sort of what you've said in the first bit, and then we can have the second part of the discussion about what next and what actions we want to take. Um, just practicalities, if you want to speak if you can use the raised hand um, function, so just in the participants list at the bottom of that on the right hand side of my screen, you can raise your hand there. Or there's not that many people here. Wave, and I'll try. I'll try and keep scanning around to see anyone who's waving at me. Um, uh, and also, alternatively, you can put questions in the chat box. And so, just to kick us off, I'll go with the question that Alistair's put in there on the bilingual education issue. I'm told there's now starting in Southern Mongolia too. Do you know much about that? The question for Sophie. Yeah, we actually haven't written as much as we would have liked about Southern Mongolia in, in recent years, uh, partly because it's difficult to get at and the problems there have not been as acute in other regions. It's worth pointing out, we have two full-time researchers for China, um, which is a little bit challenging. Uh, you know, but, but, but at its core, the problem in Southern Mongolia is the same as what we've written about in Tibet and in Xinjiang, where the authorities have decided that instead of people being allowed to learn in their mother tongue, instead they are increasingly obliged to receive their education in Chinese medium classes frequently, with the only exception of, for example, a Mongolian language class or a class on Mongolian language. So now in Tibet, for example, the one class in Tibetan that Tibetan children can expect to receive is a class on the Tibetan language, right? But in both areas, they now increasingly taught math, science, history in Chinese. And the, one of the interesting variations we've seen recently in Southern Mongolia was that instead of pushing for a near total shift into Chinese, the authorities seem to have chosen, it was history, politics, and I forget what the third class was now, but it was three very specific subjects that were now going to be taught only in Chinese. And that seemed to be a little bit of a concession to leaving some other topics to be discussed in Mongolian. Uh, but I think the trend is clear. I and mean, even uh, about a month ago saw some very small scale protests uh, amongst the ethnic Korean community that lives in Shandong in, in the Northeast around similar uh, issues. In all of these cases, there's never been a single announcement by government authorities that they will switch from one language into the other. They're very incremental policies. And actually this project on Tibet took us almost four years to pull together. Uh, 
because it was, you know, one local government announcement in one prefecture, an indication in a party level speech from a, an official visiting from Beijing over here, hearing from one family in this particular region what was happening, and really sort of piecing it together. Uh, but I think in each of these regions, we can now see that increasingly teachers from only Chinese speaking parts of the country have been sent to these regions to teach. That increasingly teachers who are from these regions, regardless of what their own language is, are required to teach in Chinese. That teaching materials are only available in Chinese. Uh, you know, one of the most interesting projects out there being driven by diaspora Tibetans is the preservation and updating of things like science textbooks in Tibetan with a view towards being able to still provide you know, a well-rounded mm -hmm. education in that language with contemporary teaching materials. So I think the, uh, the problems in each of these areas are fundamentally the same, even if they're sort of minor variations in how they're imposed or how they play out or how people respond to them. Right. Like, sorry, I should just add that, you know, we've, we've seen people be prosecuted in each of these regions simply for protesting against these policies and saying, you know, that the law requires a certain amount of education be provided in that mother tongue. So it's not a small issue domestically. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Elora, uh, yours was the first hand that I saw. If we'll go to you and then David after that. Yes, and can I just apologise that it, I joined late and I hadn't muted as I joined. So thank you, Natalie, for muting me. And Sophie, I interrupted you. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it brings back memories of the history of, in a way, Welsh and Wales and the suppression. Um, and I just wonder from the information you're gathering, Sophie, how much a reprisal is there against children using their mother tongue in schools, uh, in any public place? And how much uh, are there reprisals against anyone teaching, even at home, in their own mother tongue? And as you were saying, rewriting the textbooks, because uh, the language becomes the symbol, but the issue is actually total control. I will, sorry, I, I always fear trying to go to Google to clip links to paste in the chat because I'm afraid I'm gonna accidentally hang up on you. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, but I'm happy to post in the chat the work that we've done, looking specifically at the prosecutions of people uh, you know, who were literally only asking for education to be provided, at least to some extent, in their mother tongue. Probably the best known case is of a Tibetan activist named Tashi Wangchuk, who went to Beijing and tried to petition national level authorities to preserve uh, a certain amount of education in Tibetan. And he is doing 12 years, I think, on charges of separatism. Um, you know, to Ilham Toti, the very well-known Uyghur economist, obviously, you know, for a number of different policy changes, but he was also a very strong proponent of children being educated in their mother tongue. Uh, you know, international law isn't definitive on this topic. It doesn't say you must provide X percentage of education in mother tongue, but it is clearly a right that is meant to be uh, uh, implemented and, and people who are of the community are meant to make decisions about the medium of education. Uh, can, can I just ask you though, are there reprisals against the children? We're not aware of reprisals children against being, Okay. We're not aware of those in particular, but it would also be very difficult to document. The, I mean, Doing good research in Tibet is now a bit like doing good research in North Korea. Yes. It's incredibly hard to talk to people uh, without putting them at significant risk. risk. Yeah. We only did a handful of interviews with people inside Tibet for this project. Um, and that was essentially to conf just to confirm that the schools in their areas had switched to almost exclusively Mandarin. We weren't able to ask about 
whether the children had been targeted in particular. Um, you know, but it's worth pointing out that many of the parents that we talked to or inside and outside said, in effect, that they were perfectly happy for their children to know both languages and on some level to be educated in both languages, but they wanted it to be at least equal. Not, <laughs> you know, th there was enormous anguish at the prospect that children would grow up effectively not speaking Tibetan anymore. Uh, you know, and some very distressing, you know, examples of young children who, by virtue of now being educated almost entirely in Chinese, could no longer really communicate with, for example, grandparents who only spoke Tibetan, or that they could not learn mm -hmm. religious texts, for example, in Tibetan. <laughs> okay, we, we, we're going to come to Sorry, we, we're just going to come to David um, next, if we could. Um, and a reminder to anyone else who wants to ask a question, if you can use the raised hand function at the bottom of the participants box or wave your hand, I'll, tr I'll try and keep my eyes out. Over, over to you, David. Thanks very much, Natalie. And thank you, Soti, for that terrific overview. Just picking up from that last point, through my own visit to Tibet, I was very struck that some of the, some of the, ephemeral things were permitted. But if you mentioned the Dalai Lama, for instance, of course, that was almost like a tribal offense. And when the day comes when the Dalai Lama dies, we'll see no doubt further control being imposed about the way in which Buddhism and especially the Tibetan forms of Buddhism are actually controlled. It's no coincidence, is it, that the man who was in charge of uh, suppressing uh, Tibetan faith and also identity and culture uh, was is cu currently in charge of events in Xinjiang, uh, and again in uh, when I visited Western China. I mean, one of the, the mosques that I visited there it was a beautifully appointed building. Recently, I noticed from photographs I saw on the internet that the the uh, the dome and the minarets and so on had, had all been removed. So outwardly, you'll still see some vestige of of religion, and tourists will be shown that, no doubt. But in reality. We're seeing the suppression of freedom of religion or belief because it's regarded as a part of an identity that is is not CCP and therefore not acceptable uh, because it might pose some kind of, of risk. And so something about Article 18 would be interesting uh, to hear from you, maybe in, in, in the course of this call. Thank you. When we last talked, we talked about rebuttable presumptions and trade. And the there are two amendments running through the House of Lords at the moment one that I'm doing on genocide and linking genocide uh, to the issue of trade, that if, if it is, can be demonstrated that genocidal acts are under, underway, and if the High Court of England and Wales can confirm that, 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 that there is sufficient evidence to validate, validate that, then in those circumstances, trade would not, no longer be permitted. In addition to that, of course, there are Magnitsky sanctions as well now available. And I wondered if Human Rights Watch is doing much to draw up lists of those uh, who ought to be held to account for some of the grievous offences which have been committed. And on that question of justice and the judiciary, you hinted in your own remarks earlier on some discomfort that there are still leading judicial figures in Hong Kong uh, who are playing a part there in legitimising Carrie Lam's view of, of justice. Um, Whereas a very celebrated Australian jurist uh, has resigned, saying he didn't feel that with the new national security law he could carry out his duties. And, and finally, if I can ask you about the Hong Kong 12, who, whom you, you mentioned, what, whether you know any more about their situation, particularly about Andy Lee, whom I met during the elections last year. He was helping to organize the team who were monitor, international team that was part of monitoring those elections. And he's now, as you said, being held in mainland China. I noticed a remarkable uh, Chinese woman, Hong Kong woman, who herself was taken, uh, abducted, and has now returned to Hong Kong, Grandma Wong, um, who has been protesting in Hong Kong on behalf of the Hong Kong 12. She's surely the sort of person that Hong Kong Watch and maybe the All Party Group should be nominating for a Nobel Prize for her courage and bravery. But I think that's enough from me, Natalie. Okay, Sophie, if you want to pick up some, some of that, all of that. <laughs> Uh, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll do my very best here. Uh, I think Grandma Wong probably has a spine of steel. Uh, she's an extraordinary person. We don't have any particular updates on the Hong Kong 12, except to be able to say broadly that we feel their rights to fair trial are being 
uh, uh, wholly ignored. We're very concerned that they don't have counsel of choice, that there isn't the kind of access for family members. You know, all of the pathologies that we regularly demonstrate in the mainland, I think, are on display here. Um, you know, and any of the governments that that has a stake in this, whether because some of the people are BNOs, there's one person who's a dual Hong Kong Portuguese citizen. Um, I think as much as those governments can weigh in might might help secure a slightly less bad outcome. Um, the Australian judge who's just retired, I gathered he was retiring on the schedule that he did not that he did not retire because of the larger situation, but that nevertheless, he took the opportunity to express his concerns on the occasion of his retirement about the overall trajectory of the rule of law. Um, we might have slightly different information, but that was my understanding uh, of the, the context there. Uh, yes, we are fans of the Magnitsky legislation and the idea of individual targeted sanctions. Yes, we have made recommendations. You know, I, I think tools like that are exponentially stronger the more multilateral they are. You know, it's it's you know it's it's all fine and well to you know block people's access to one particular jurisdiction or one financial system, but they still have others from which to choose. And and the more of those avenues can be shut off you know, the more those sanctions really hurt. Um, last but not least on the freedom of religion, just very briefly, when the uh, we were marking uh, the Panchen Lama's 25th birthday, the real Panchen Lama that is, who's been disappeared for, for 25 years now, we were reflecting on the extraordinary and I think truly perverse efforts that the Chinese government makes, not simply to crush or manage religion, but to offer some proxy in the hopes that, <laughs> that people will buy into that. Yeah. And I think for a long time, Chinese government officials thought that, among other things, that as they helped make Tibetans more affluent, that they would become not only less religious, but less devoted to the Dalai Lama. And if you look at the amount of time and money and effort Beijing has put into trying to get Tibetans to shift their loyalty to the fake Panchen Lama, it's extraordinary, especially given how totally unsuccessful it's been. It's been a staggering failure. Nobody buys it. Uh, and I think that must be very frustrating, but I think that's a function of policy made by people who don't understand what what faith is and how deeply held an individual right it is. Uh, and you know, they seem to think that they could kind of socially engineer people into a different way of believing. And I think Tibetans are making it quite clear they're not having a bar of that. That said, I do think one of the real priorities for a number of governments should be uh, uh, thinking through the unhappy reality that looms uh, when the Dalai Lama does pass. Uh, and what the appropriate responses are in those circumstances, because I'm quite sure Beijing has a game plan and everybody else who feels differently should have one too. Thank you. Okay, sure. I think James, I think you had a question if you'd like to come in. Yep. Um, thank you, thank you very much. May I say, I think that uh, David Dalton has contributed a great service in raising human rights issues. Uh, for example, the organ harvesting, which is taking place, uh, is uh, a monstrous criminal act um, in any country, and they must know that, and that it it affects their standing in the world. Um, can I ask about the overseas Chinese? I'm particularly thinking of Singapore. I get the impression that their approach is different, uh, that they are much more democratic, uh, and respect of, to a much greater extent of human rights. And I just wonder how important that could be in the future. Uh, also, with regard to trade, which China obviously wishes to expand, um, it will help if they are more frank with us and more open. Uh, for example, on research, they don't seem to want to share research very readily with us. And I'm thinking particularly of what is immediately assaulting us uh, through coronavirus and so on. Uh, I think there is a dilemma as to what they will and what they will not accept. And it's very useful if we 
gain a, an accurate appreciation of what that is. Um, as I think they, I get the impression they plan for the long term, for many years ahead, uh, and not immediately. Um, and that they keep long term um, aims very much in mind. On the, on the latter point, I agree entirely. Uh, but I also think that's one of the, <laughs> the benefits, I use that term sarcastically, of authoritarianism. You know, this is, this is a government that has now been in power for decades and does not have to contemplate, you know, wide ranging debates on alternative approaches to policy. Uh, you know, and I think Xi Jinping's consolidation of power strengthens that ability to say, you know, here, here's what our 50 year plan looks like when you know, many of the governments that we work with are on three, four, five year electoral cycles. Um, I think one of the most urgent priorities for governments like the UK and rights respecting US government and other allies is to look at forming a counterweight to the Chinese government's influence across the UN's human rights system. That's easily a 10 year project. Yeah. You know, getting a bunch of democracies to sign up to that for that length of time is, is not a small project, but I think it, it merits that kind of attention. Um, on, the, on the question of overseas Chinese, I suppose the good news is that one need not necessarily look outside of China for people who would like to live under a democratic rule. <laughs> There are, I think, plenty of people inside China who hold those views and simply aren't allowed to articulate them or press for those. Uh, you know, in the best example of overseas Chinese, uh, you know, engaging in, engaging, promoting, appreciating, and defending robust democracy is, of course, in Taiwan, uh, you know, which has also been a phenomenal example of how you handle something like a pandemic through entirely democratic and rights respecting means. I think it's been a remarkable reminder that way. And you know, it's what Hong Kong was meant to have been, maybe, <laughs> but it certainly won't be anymore. But I do think that uh, it's helpful for governments to recall that it's the Chinese government that is undemocratic, not that Chinese people are. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we've just got a few minutes left, and I'm very aware of the desire to sort of get to the point of things that we can do and some practical steps mm -hmm. and what we should be asking for. And I just note that Margaret noted in the chat box that 24th to the 11th is the uh, FCDO oral questions, so it would be useful to circulate some questions, so that's something for the perhaps Secretariat to note um, that. And I'm going to come to the question that Francis asked, which perhaps get us started off, and if, uh, Sophie, if you could reflect on what um, sort of let and use this and reflect on what we should be doing and if others have any particular questions about things we should be doing. I also note that David that your um, suggestion about Grandma Wong and that's something we may not have time to have fully discussed today but we've certainly put it down as a marker on the agenda. Um, so the question from Francis was what might be the international forums that the PRC value but which are highly critical of what was going on in, uh, in China thinking perhaps of space research, something like that. So Sophie, if you could respond to that, perhaps take us forward into the what next. Right, well, I, I think you know, Human Rights Watch's perspective is very much about international human rights forums. Uh, I mean, obviously there are other ones that Beijing values, uh, certainly things like the Paris cl uh, climate talks or mm -hmm. its ability to exercise influence at the UN Security Council uh, in a number of different UN agencies. Uh, but I think, you know, really robust planning for the long-term leadership at an institution like the Human Rights Council now is critical, especially as the UK has a particular opportunity to demonstrate further leadership in that institution at a particularly critical moment. And, you know, the challenge is not mm -hmm. in, you know, asking the Foreign Office whether it plans to, plans to but whether it will, push ahead supporting a mandate on China and accountability for gross violations in Xinjiang, but also looking at the threat the Chinese government poses to the UN's human rights ecosystem as a whole. Those are related but different projects, uh, you know, because Beijing is really doing a pretty good job of 
quietly eroding at the margins these different bodies that are critical to holding it accountable. And that requires a kind of coordinated response and resources uh, that really can't wait. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the quick answer to that question. And I think you, you've picked up some of what David was asking about the undermining of the uh, human rights. But he, David also asked a specific question in the chat about why so many Islamic countries signed the UN statements mm. supporting China um, and we, uh, over the Uyghurs. Well, the short answer to that, I think, is that a number of them are themselves you know, horrific human rights violators. Uh, there is a tremendous awareness inside those countries about the Uyghurs. Uh, some of those countries are broke and they need Chinese government money. Uh, the organization of Islamic cooperation is a little bit of a mystery to me. You know, it, the amount of attention that is spent, you know, appropriately towards Islamophobia or attacks on Muslims in countries like the US or UK is warranted, there's no commensurate focus on China. You know, we've I, tried very hard to engage a number of those governments, but it is slow boring through hard boards, no doubt. Okay, I'm aware that we've technically got two minutes left and I do usually try and try and finish these things more or less on time. Um, what I'm going to do is I, I've got a little bit of uh, all party parliamentary group business that just I just need to go through. So while I'm doing that, if anyone has any pressing questions, they want to come to Sophie and Sophie, I'll, I'll then, then give you a chance for a minute or two to sort of just wrap up in terms of what the, perhaps the three key points are, but I'll also allow space for any questions then. But just on a little bit of housekeeping for the all party parliamentary group, uh, we have um, four offers to serve as vice chairs, uh, which is Layla Moran, Siobhan McDonnell, uh, Owen Thompson and Stuart McDonald, who are all MPs. Uh, that's uh, Lib Dem, Labour and two SNP. Um, so I, I'm i assuming that we can, unless anyone wants to yell formally, agree at this meeting to approve those new vice chairs. Um, and I'm not seeing anyone screaming, so I'm going to assume that's true and we'll call that something like an election. Um, uh, I see that, um, uh, yes, I don't think there's any other questions and I can't see any other raised hands and no one's waving at me. So... Sophie, really, if you can just sort of wrap up, sure. focus on the future future act. Oh, oh sorry, is someone trying to come in? I'm not sure who oh. it was. No, no. All right, sorry, sorry, Sophie. If you can just give us sort of a couple of minutes wrap up of what we need to take away and what we need to do, I suppose, is 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 the big focus. What you see is perhaps the big three as big steps, most useful steps we can do. Sure, I think the you know the three priorities are that first you've already you know you've got a trifecta of incredibly strong ambassadors, uh, Ambassador Braithwaite in Geneva, uh, Ambassador Woodward now in New York, and Ambassador Pierce now here in Washington, who have you know obviously along with the Foreign Office staked out good tough positions on Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong. Chinese human rights defenders, you name it. The, the, the $64,000 question is whether the UK, with others, of course, but the UK, I think, is uniquely poised to take a leadership role, is going to turn that into more than just another joint statement, right? The step, the key step is now to really push for an investigation and a, and a standing mandate. So that's number one, but you're very, I think you're well poised to do that. Number two, I think the safe haven that's been extended to people from Hong Kong can and should on some level be broadened uh, to other people who might need that status, whether that's you know, Chinese university students in the UK who <laughs> want real academic freedom to take advantage of being there, whether it's Tibetans or Uyghurs who are seeking asylum. I think that should be a priority as well. Uh, and then number three, I think pushing on with some of the legislation that's under consideration, particularly to scrutinize British businesses and whether they are an asset or a problem on all of these issues uh, is, an, is an equally important piece of the puzzle. You know, it's you can legislate the rebuttable presumption all you want, but when you know major British banks are cheering for the national security legislation in Hong Kong, it somewhat undercuts that effort. I think. Okay. Um... 
a very, very commendably brief and a huge amount of work for all of us there uh, to do. Um, I think it only falls to me to say thank you very much, Sophie, um, for spending the time talking us to a day while we're all, and you know, for, for not being distracted. I don't think I saw you glance at your screen once to see what might be happening closer to home. So, you know, well, well done on that, <laughs> given, the, given all of the pressures that things are under, under today. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much to everyone who's come along to this meeting of the All-Party Parliamentary Group. Um, you, there's a huge amount going on. Um, our Secretariat, thank you very much to them for organising this, and they're there as a resource you know, for all the members to use. Um, and you, there's a huge amount going on in the world. We've got to offer messages of hope, messages of support, show people that there is a way forward and that human rights should be available to everyone. And let's really, you know, at least occasionally just focus on imagining a world where that is the case around the world and that's what we're all working towards so thank you very much everyone and you know try and have a peaceful weekend and hopefully soon we can all uncross our fingers at least to some degree <laughs> thank you all thank you natalie for sharing thank it you. so well thank you thank, thank you. you so much for all Great. your attention bye-bye